everyone, I'm Mikey and welcome back to Mikey Reacts. I'm coming to you from the Middle East, specifically Dubai. It's a bit overcast today, but it's still like 110 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know, let's have a look what's Fahrenheit. Uh, let's, uh, it's 40, it's 114 degrees Fahrenheit today. So it is hot. Um, so today we've got a great video for you. It's a scenario video and it is called could the US military conquer the UK if it wanted to? This was filmed in 2019. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say yes. I think the UK will be a great contender because although we're a small country, um, we have quite a good military power and very good, I mean, we are allies with the United States, so we really have as much technology as you do. The only difference will be, obviously, is would be the manpower and the size of our military. But let's have a look and see what this video has to say. I might learn some new things. Don't forget also, if you enjoy this content, like this video and subscribe to the channel. It really, really helps us. And if you want to support the channel financially, you can do it. I'm not asking you to, but if you do want to, you can hit that super thanks button and money goes directly to me and helps keep building this channel. Check out my, uh, my Patreon, Twitter and Instagram down in the description. And don't forget just to sit back, relax and enjoy this video. Patreon, by the way, is only $5 per month and there's loads of great exclusive content up on there. So let's get to this video. Could the US military conquer the UK? We all know US and UK are close allies yeah. and that US armed might is far greater than that of the UK. But just for argument's sake and to learn what sort of limitations waging warfare across the ocean implies, this video will explore US invading the United Kingdom. So, with just the airplanes and ships left to count on, is an invasion over the Atlantic viable? Okay, let's <laughs> Welcome to Binkov's HQ. <laughs> you know, not many managed to invade Britain. Ones that did were the Vikings. And if you like Vikings, War of Clans might be the browser game you're looking for. Did you know that people play Vikings today is from all free using devices Viking if it wanted to some rules will apply US gets no overseas bases and okay. all other countries are impassable distance from US to UK mainland is pretty big especially when reaching London before trying to land any troops the seas must first be clear of British ships and Royal Air Force must be suppressed US has a massive advantage when it comes to naval assets Basically, all of its assets are made for oceans and could operate near UK, mm. if needed. While the Americans would need to sail to and from Britain, taking weeks away from their actual presence, US Navy could pretty much do whatever it pleases near the UK. It's interesting to point out that most of US ships do not carry anti-ship missiles. US Navy prefers to use their carriers for such missions. Yeah. British Royal Navy is to go down a similar route. Their harpoon missiles are old and said to be retired soon. Not all ships have them. Only a minor part of the British fleet has modern air defense systems. Basically, the sea war would be fought above the sea and under it, mm -hmm. but the British lack anti-ship missiles for its aircraft. Okay. Furthermore, British Tornado aircraft ceased to train for the anti-ship missions almost two decades ago. Basically, if UK had to try and do air raids against US fleet, it would be down to two weapons, laser-guided bombs and short-range tactical missiles. Okay. Brimstone in particular might be the weapon of choice. While its warhead is tiny, Brimstone 2 has a decent range. Still, against dozens of potent destroyers designed to deal with many anti-ship missiles at once, it's unlikely UK could do much. Yeah. British best bet would be their submarines. They're fairly modern. Theoretically, the British could use their ballistic missile subs as attack subs as well, and speed up the entry into service of another astute sub, while keeping one Trafalgar running a bit longer, rummaging for retired sailors to crew it. Still, the British would be far outnumbered. Yeah. US submarine fleet dwarfs theirs. Given a bit less time on station and British home advantage when it comes to resupply, the balance of power may not be quite 6 to 1. Still, it's no question the British subs would get hunted down within months. Aerial anti-submarine platforms would also play a large role. And while the British could use all their assets, even just the deployable portion of US assets would be enough to force the British subs into hiding. 
it's at this point, guys, that you realize just how big the US military is. It is ridiculously powerful. More US carrier based air power would make it hard for British anti sub helicopters to operate. The main force projection would be done by US carriers, naturally. US could choose whether to use more carriers initially and then have less available later on, or to maintain a smaller number on constant patrol. To defeat the British Air Force, the former is more likely. Royal Air Force. US nominally has 11 carriers, but only 9 air wings. It does have an additional support wing, which is a lot bigger. It may be the source of one or two more combat wings, after some months of preparation. But crews aren't the only issue. Lifespan of a carrier necessarily involves lengthy maintenance periods. Okay. Important to note is that the deployable period doesn't mean the carrier can actually be on a mission the whole time. Usually one or two deployments are made during those 18 months. Okay. Missions are usually 6 to 8 months long and several months are needed to prep the carrier and its wing for another mission. Okay. Shorter missions might give more deployments in the short term, but in the long term they would require even more maintenance for every month spent out at sea. Yeah. Because of all that, it's unrealistic US would send out more than 6 carriers at once after a few months of prep time. Similar issues would affect the aviation assault ships. Perhaps four to six could be deployed at once, after some preparations. Okay. Grand total of combat planes US Navy and Marine Corps could muster in a few months long air campaign is thus smaller than the total number of US planes. US might fly in fresh planes to replace ones that got lost. Flying them over the ocean to a carrier would be doable. What could the British respond with? Royal Air Force is smaller than even the readily available US planes deployed on carriers. Yeah. Another huge issue for the British would be their lack of air defenses. Everything they currently have are fairly low altitude systems, meaning the US would be free to bomb them from high up with guided weapons. UK would also suffer the US cruise missile barrage. While the Brits have some such missiles of their own, it's unlikely they would be used against the faraway US bases. Even the subs that could carry them would be better utilized for defense of the homeland. Yeah. While not all could be launched at once, US could sustain the effort. The British Air Force would be mostly paralyzed on the ground. US has also a much bigger recon platform fleet, especially when it comes to satellites. British lack those, as in the real world they timeshare some US spy satellites. US aircraft would be looking for targets as well. Britain would have no real means of scouting the US bases. Okay. US AWACS type planes would be plentiful, while British ones would mostly be trapped on the ground, with runways and highways being mostly inoperative. Thus the Royal Air Force would slowly get destroyed on the ground. When they would be able to get some planes airborne, they still may not choose to engage the Americans, as it's likely US attack waves would be made of close to a hundred planes with possibly as many fighters as Britain would muster for each local interception, yeah. or more. The best Britain could hope for would be a roughly equal kill ratio in the air. And when the losses on the ground are included, over months of a protracted bombing campaign, US would still be left with a sizable force. All this didn't even include the US Air Force. While the scenario requires it to use the bases inside the US, Britain could be reached. Yeah. At first, bombers would be deploying cruise missiles, but later on, they would be likely used for bombing missions. But could the Air Force tactical plane fleet help out as well? With very ample in-flight refueling, the answer is yes. Yeah. US operates the world's biggest air tanker fleet. The Hercules-based tankers, however, are too small and would use most of the fuel just to get near Britain. Still, the remainder of the fleet has a substantial fuel offload capacity, and tankers could refuel each other. Such ops may sound complex, but compared to what the British did in Falklands War, they're fairly basic. The British used a dozen tankers to refuel themselves repeatedly, keeping the bomber refueled throughout all of the route. While all of the tanker fleet would not be available due to maintenance, the rest could still offload significant fuel loads just outside Britain if needed. With several refuelings per plane, US Air Force could still expect to have around 400 combat planes in action practically every day. The British would really have no chance in the air. Within months, the US would have complete control of the air. And thus the second phase of the invasion might commence. By that time, British ships would be mostly dead, 
even if they hugged the shores and just aided in the air defenses. British submarines might hold out a bit longer, if not being used to actively hunt down US ships. But even if British subs managed to kill two US vessels for each of their own, final result would be the end of the Royal Navy. So at around six months or so into the war, the landings would be mostly unopposed, except for the Royal Army defending the shores. Six months would be enough for the US to assemble pretty much all of their active and reserve assets. In addition to landing ships, US could count on numerous cargo assets of its Sea Lift Command and Reserve Fleet, in case a port is secured. US Airborne could also help, with the numbers shown probably growing with newly trained paratroopers. Yeah. Getting additional heavier equipment for them, however, would not be likely, given the time limit. US transport plane fleet is pretty big, and should be able to drop all the airborne troops within days. US could be looking at close to 30,000 troops during the first day, and close to 20,000 more the day after. Subsequent days would see fewer and fewer troops being added, and more and more supplies being brought in. The British would enjoy more soldiers than shown before. The reserve mentioned covers only the soldiers receiving some training periodically, and soldiers for whom some heavy equipment is stored. In an event of a total war, Britain would be using those six months to mobilize as many soldiers as possible. While they would be equipped with basically just rifles, and while their training would be less than adequate, they would still boost the overall numbers several times. Yet, all those soldiers may not be enough, as UK has a problem of... Right. His scenario could have gone a lot better for the United States here. I mean, I know they're winning, but it could have been a lot faster. Take, if it were me, I would land in Northern Ireland. I would take Northern Ireland completely. That wouldn't take too long. So I would land all 50,000 of my troops in Northern Ireland. And then I would actually, more likely than not, use that as a base. I would spend time building an air base there, um, building a port there, well, utilizing Belfast already, and then using that as a way to land troops on mainland um, England, Wales, and Scotland. But, you know, let's see. Its landmass is just too large. Its coastline is very long. Even when taking just the western part of its coastline into account, the area to be defended is huge. And what about the islands? Perfect for US to take and entrench themselves at, before launching further landings from them. Most of those areas are sufficiently far away from the mainland that British artillery would not be much of a factor. And what about Northern Ireland? There are just too many places for US to concentrate its assault on. The British would not be able to move their forces around easily and protect those islands or the Northern Ireland. Yeah. So the islands would fall one by one then either Northern Ireland would be taken or part of Great Britain would fall. Hard to traverse overland Scotland would be an obvious choice, though that would also slow down US breakthrough as well later on. Cornwall or Devon are also decent picks, as British defenders lack room to swoop down on the US beachhead from all directions, though such areas would likely be more heavily populated by British military to begin with. Yeah. Once the US manages to secure ports and airfields, and brings in US Army reinforcements, it would be basically game over for the British. US would build up its helicopter force on the areas it has taken, which is considerable. While the British have a fleet of their own to help quickly distribute its forces where needed, their numbers are small. Both sides would of course be losing many helicopters, US to British low-level air defenses and British to US fighter cover, which would continuously be flying over the important areas. The British would have only a small part of shown inventory of heavy weapons present at any one point the US attacks. While US would also not be disembarking thousands of its Abrams tanks or 10,000 of other heavy combat vehicles, the overwhelming fire support coming from various directions would more than make up for it. Fire support from the ships may come in form of MLR units firing from the ships rather than actual gun barrage. US ships still lack long-range gun rounds. Attack helicopters are another way of concentrating force in one area quickly, but again the British are far outmatched, even if just half of US numbers are present. Yeah. The issue for the Americans would be time, 
As the scenario asks what can be achieved within one year, US would be under pressure to progress from their multiple beachheads. Northern Ireland is likely to fall within the one year time limit, but only minor parts of the Great Britain would be overrun by the Americans during the same time period. The British would put up a hell of a fight. That's the, that's Ground troop sure. loss ratio would favor the British somewhat, but when Air Force and Navy losses are added in, where Britain would suffer more heavily, the US would come out fine. With added large chunks of conquered territory, the US could call itself a victor. Big thanks goes to all my... Yeah, I mean, it becomes a matter of time once you get those beachheads in. Um, I think it would be difficult to advance from those beachheads because the, US, the UK is actually pretty well defended. Um, it uses a very similar method of defense, of homeland defense as the US does, in terms of uh, where troops are placed and obviously um, with its strategic ports uh, around as well. I think the main one to go for would be Northern Ireland first and then use that as a base to jump off from. And then you could really fight a war of attrition, even though that's not really a, a, a good way to go. But yeah, guys, it's pretty much what I expected. I expected the US to always come out on top in that situation. I don't think there are really many countries that the US would find hard to invade. I mean, when you really come down to it, the, the, the most difficult countries to invade would be those that have the largest land mass uh, purely because of logistics like China and Russia, for example. But yeah, that's pretty much what I expected. I like him. He, he, he seems to know his stuff and I like the way he talks. It's really, really great. Good channel. I'll definitely watch more of his stuff for sure. But yeah, guys, I, I definitely I definitely pictured the, U, the US winning on that one. There's just the power is just too much. When you take away the land troops, uh, when, you, when you're fighting, you know, boots on the ground, it, it might be more of an even match, not because of the size, obviously the size when it comes to the amount of troops that the US could dedicate to the invasion, they would obviously outnumber the UK troops. But I think because of uh, terrain familiarity, like any invasion and uh, built up, uh, you know, forts, um, forts, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Position, already built positions that would really hinder the US invasion but eventually you know after engaging for over a year probably and a little longer you, they could have the entire UK as that's the reality but we thank God that we are allies and that would never happen I hope <laughs> uh, but yeah that would that would not be a good day for anyone really but that's that will never ever happen not in a million years uh, thank God although interestingly enough I believe after the Second World War there were plans drawn up from the US to invade the UK. I can't remember exactly what the reason was. I'll do some research on that and come back to you, but um, I think they were just preliminary, preliminary plans just in case they needed to. So I'm sure that the US has thought about it at some point in time. Um, but really interesting stuff, guys. Thank you very much for recommending this. It was an absolutely great video. I hope you enjoyed it and we'll see you on the next one. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you enjoyed it. And also don't forget to check out my Patreon, Twitter and Instagram. You will absolutely love them. I promise there's exclusive content that you won't get here on YouTube and you will absolutely love it. It will um, give you some extra things to watch, some more in-depth analyses of uh, history and politics. So have a great day, guys, and I will see you on the next one.